All right, it is that time once again. What's up, everybody? Ben Raza, Mac here for betting you and for Odd Chopper. It is week one of college football, but don't let that fool you. We had a week zero. We already played some games. We already cashed some tickets. We're going to talk about that. We're going to dive into all the games, whether it's Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. Touch upon everything you need to know and hopefully jump on some of these lines early. Matt, we have seen seven games. We have seen various levels of football. What were your thoughts on week zero? Yeah, we started out with a real banger that Nebraska oh Northwestern God. game. Now it wasn't that wasn't what we expected. You know, the Western Kentucky game wasn't great either, barely getting by Austin P. But yeah, I don't know. I I mean, when you lose to Northwestern, I'm not really confident in our in our Nebraska win totals anymore. But Illinois took care of Wyoming like we expected. UConn covered despite losing their starting quarterback to a torn ACL. I mean Vandy, Vandy looked awesome against Hawaii. Yeah, those were some of the big ones. Charlotte, I mean, your starting quarterback gets hurt. It's kind of rough. But overall, I went 6-3. and three. It was a good week. I was really happy with it. Uh, Scott Frost, onside kick. There is no defense for that. Uh, I, I really don't understand. That win total is in trouble. I was really encouraged, though. I have the under because of you on Western Kentucky's win total, and they did not look good. I think they might be in for a rough year. My big bet was Vanderbilt talked about it all week. They were down seven, nothing. Then they scored about 60 unanswered. No exaggeration. I mean, that that's how we do it. I thought we we're going to get unlucky with UConn. We did not even with the backup quarterback, their defense played well. And then yes, Chris Reynolds going down that that's nothing you can do with Charlotte. I was really happy with the start. Uh, if you watch betting you, I have a feeling you were pretty happy with the start out there. And if you want to support this show, hit that like button. Let's get the likes up. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel we've got a lot going on but we've got a million games here we're going to dive into them we're going to be talking about all sorts of things so let's not waste any time let's get to it and i actually want to start with two games that i have a feeling we're not even going to have plays for but i want to ask you right off the top about the big games and we can get through those and we'll dive into some of where i think the biggest edges are but you've got two marquee matchups you've got ohio state and Notre dame ohio state 17 point favorite you've got georgia and oregon Georgia 17 point favorite. I'm not betting either of these. I don't know there's much to do with them. Do you have any thoughts on what you expect or do you just expect Georgia and Ohio State to win by around two touchdowns? Yeah, I don't see any value here. So just to quickly touch on it with Ohio State, I think it's going to come down to one key matchup how their new defensive coordinator, Knowles, does against the run. Notre Dame is breaking in a new quarterback. He played a little bit last year. And they already lost their best receiver to a torn ACL. So they also have a very good offensive line with a ton of returning production. So they're going to try to run on Ohio State. That was a weakness for them last year. You even saw it against teams like Oregon. How Jim Knowles does against that, we're going to find out. We know Ohio State's going to throw it around the yard. So can Notre Dame exploit that advantage? I don't know. I'm not betting it. With Georgia taking on Oregon, Georgia's breaking in essentially seven new starters on defense. We know they rotate a lot. So these guys do have experience overall. And you're going up against presumably Bonix. It's been a quarterback battle there. And don't know who's starting just yet. But overall, I don't know how this Oregon offense is going to actually move the ball against a strong Georgia defense. Georgia's offense, that might actually be the strength of their team this year. They go really deep at tight end, which they can use to create a lot of mismatches. But don't see any value here either. I prefer betting Georgia compared to the Ohio State game if I were to take one. Uh, yeah, I really don't see much here. It's not like... You're not going to lay money line pieces because you're getting it's like minus a thousand. That's unplayable, in my opinion. I don't really see either dog sticking around. I think of, of the four teams, I'll say this. I think Notre Dame is the most unknown. I think there's a chance they're they're better than people think. And they, they could, in theory, give Ohio State a little scare. We also saw Ohio State last year drop an inexplicable game at home. So it's not like they're invincible. Uh, I'd say it's doubtful, though. I really don't think that. And the beauty of college football, you've got 70 games. You don't have to force in these, these top 25 matchups. So although they're cool games to watch, and I will be watching them, I would save your money. I don't think this is a great opportunity. There are plenty more games on the board. And let's start getting to it because, again, there are matchups all throughout the week. There's one big game, quote-unquote big game, on Thursday. And let's start there. Penn State, Purdue. Pretty competitive spread. Penn State goes on the road, but they're still three and a half point favorite. You got a 53 and a half point total. John Clifford, who never leaves. Uh, what are we looking at for the Nittany Lions and how good is Purdue going to be this year? 
I'm not sure how good Purdue is going to be. I have my doubts. They lost their two best players in Carl Loftus and, and David Bell. I think you might be able to consider their quarterback kind of in that range. But again, he he's breaking in a lot of weapons. This Purdue team basically went over to Iowa and took their starting receivers, Tyrone Tracy, Charlie Jones. They both came over in the transfer portal. I mean, they played for Iowa, so they're kind of unknowns, even at this point in their careers. Otherwise, you're going to be looking at like Brock Thompson and Payne Durham, their tight end, as leading receivers. Going up against the strength of Penn State's defense, they have a good secondary, and they've had a good secondary for years. Their coaching staff's very good at coaching that. O'Connell's a non-mobile quarterback, and we know Penn State has been able to generate some pass rush as well, so that's a concern to me. And overall, this Penn State team is recruiting at an extremely high level. So they were able to fill some gaps this year, I think, through recruiting. They have an amazing running back coming in in Nick Singleton. Drew Allar, quarterback, he's not going to play this year. They're going to trot out Clifford, to your point. But this is going to be a Penn State team that is deeper, I think, than previous seasons because of some of the people they've added. Offensive line, they actually got rid of some players that weren't very good there, so expecting a little bit of an improvement here. And then they bandage over the Jahan Dotson loss with Mitchell Tinsley coming over from Western Kentucky. That guy was a baller. He'll now have to play up in the Big Ten, so we'll see if he can make that jump. But I'm optimistic based on what we saw last year. And then you always have Parker Washington back. He was a strong breakout last year behind Jahan Dotson. And Keandre Lambert-Smith is now a veteran with this program. He was a full-time starter last year, not to mention two tight ends coming back. So to me, there's just a big talent gap. And then, I mean, we didn't even talk about Purdue's defense. We, we mentioned, like, Carl Loftus briefly. But this team wasn't even good with Carl Loftus on defense. They were outside the top 180 in total defense. I mean – you got a player that was borderline first round pick. Why is your defense finishing 107th overall? So I said outside the top 80, they were actually outside the top 100 in overall defense. Their coverage was 102nd overall and their pass rush was 32nd with Carl Loftus. And now you're losing an NFL talent. So I don't know. This Purdue defense is rough to me. I couldn't believe this was within three points at one time. And I think you might be able to still find some threes out there. It's kind of been bouncing back and forth. I would probably take this. Like if you could take some alternate lines like Purdue, excuse me, Penn State up to like a touchdown here. It, it really hasn't moved much. It's held steady. And you certainly make the case that Purdue's defense, they, they lost their alpha. They weren't that good to begin with. Even offensively, they definitely have some pieces coming back and they will be a pretty good offensive unit. I want to see exactly what they have on the outside. They've lost some playmakers there. I'm with you. You definitely like Penn State more than me. This is one I've seen you highlight a little. And I think that Tinsley is an underrated piece for sure. Uh, do you expect, not that this is going to determine the spread by any stretch, do you expect Penn State to trot out that true freshman running back for, for major carries? He's going to be in a timeshare. Okay. Everything okay. coming out of Penn State suggests that. But I mean, like the back end of my model, and this is some of the better models across the league, have Penn State like around the top 10. Like probably one of the most underrated teams in the country. I think this spread is significantly off. There we go. We get things started. Penn State, lay the points. And I am with you. If I, if I back this, I probably am going to be on Penn State in this game. I'm going to have to search for some threes, but you'll easily find three and a half. They're all over the place. So you can absolutely get that. Let's move, because uh, again, we're going to get to a bunch of games today, to Friday night. And this, is a, this is a bet that I jumped on, and it's, it is moving. TCU, Colorado. TCU hits the road. It's up to 14 now in a lot of spots. Uh, it was at 10 and a half just a couple days ago. I had it there. I have it at 13 and a half as well. I really think TCU is a good buy low candidate in this spot and in this season. So talk to me about that. And then I want to ask you the reports, though, that they may play three quarterbacks. Does that deter you from this bet? No, it doesn't. And I think it's pretty much down to two Chandler Morris or Max Dugan. And good boy. Dugan's a veteran. He he is what he is. His adjusted completion percentage was 72%, 8.9 yards per attempt. Those are fine numbers. He's mobile as well, and he's been hurt a lot in his career. But Chandler Morris, he's a guy that played really well in a small sample when he was asked to come into games last year. I think he actually offers them maybe a little more upside overall. But either way, they're better than whatever Colorado is going to put on the field. JT Shroud, if he's healthy, or Brandon Lewis, they also listed – those quarterbacks with that or tag. And if you can't beat up Brandon Lewis, I don't really know what to say at this point. Brandon Lewis was horrific last year, 58% completion, 6.0 yards per attempt. 
But again, Colorado's going through an extended rebuild. Last year, they were 115th on offense, 113th on defense, 117th on the offensive line, 123rd in pass rush, 102nd in coverage. This is not something you can just bandage over year over year. And then you look at their recruiting, they were 47th. That's not great. They were 78th in transfers. That's not good at all. So they didn't even like bandage over some of these weaknesses they do have on their team. TCU has a ton of production coming back. Their receiver position is extremely strong. Quinton Johnson's a future NFL player. Darius Davis, Tay Barber, Quincy Brown, Blair Conrad. These guys all have significant snaps. And then they do lose Zach Evans. But Kendry Miller was awesome last year. 5.06 yards after contact, 0.358 force missed tackles per attempt. Those were better numbers than Zach Evans on a fairly small sample, just 83 carries. But the guy averaged seven and a half yards per carry. This guy's awesome. And then they added Louisiana transfer, Amani Bailey, who was pretty solid down there with the Rage and Cajuns too. So they're deep. This is a team that should just bully Colorado and take this 14 points easily. I grabbed it at 10 and a half, still comfortable with this minus 14. I would try to get it before it goes above two scores, but this is a big mismatch. Time is now to grab this. Uh, I'm with you across. I, I've said this in our previews. I don't think Colorado's going to win a single game this year. They play a brutal non-conference <laughs> schedule and they get into back 12. They better beat Arizona because they're not going to beat TCU, Air Force, or Minnesota, particularly with a couple on the road. I don't see this being competitive. I think TCU straight outclasses them, and you're going to see one team with a very upward trajectory. I like the coaching change for TCU. I actually think they're going to be a much more dynamic offense uh, and get the mo- those receivers. Uh, you mentioned them already. They got pros out there. Those guys know what they're doing. They've got multiple quarterbacks. Zach Evans is a great player, but they'll replace him just fine. If, if the offensive line is solid, I, I really think TCU is going to steamroll them here. This could be Vandy Hawaii-esque. Yeah, they've got a decent offensive line, and then they return eight starters in defense. So you have a team that already can't score, now going up against, I won't say it's good, but it's veterans. So they have a chance to take a pretty solid step forward here. It's a surprise to me to see it this low. So there we go. We got one Thursday. We got one Friday. We'll have a couple more. And certainly, if you're looking for full breakdowns on this very channel, yours truly and, of course, Matt, will be going Game by game in those videos you saw it last week will be rapid fire Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So there'll be plenty of games that you can get there and get those breakdowns too uh, if you're looking for them. Now, let's start to dive into Saturday. We've got a really interesting matchup with a team we have seen, North Carolina and App State. North Carolina is the slimmest of favorites. It's up to like a point and a half in some spots. So we saw them trot out Luke May's brother. They played Florida AM, and and I'll be honest, They actually looked pretty terrible considering Florida A&M was missing like 30 guys and they were still moving the ball up and down. So I don't know what that means for UNC's defense. Maybe they weren't playing uh, the the real guys. I saw Grimes get hurt, but let's step back. Let's just talk about North Carolina. What did you see and what do you think against a much tougher opponent? I I didn't watch this game personally, so I just saw Drake. It was ugly. It was (laughs) raining. It was, it was an ugly game. I, I, Drake May seems to have played well. His stats yeah. indicated, and, and Twitter seems to think it. I mean, he's playing against an FCS team, so a good time to break him in. He's a really high recruit. This guy was basically like on the verge of being a top 50 recruit in his class, last year's class, and he has solid mobility. So I, there's upside with him. He's now going to be facing a far more competent opponent. I think their run game is fine, especially with like Omari and Hampton, who seems to have played really well. He's another incoming four-star back. He's gotten comparisons to Javante Williams. I'm not going to go that far personally. We know what he has on the outside. Josh Downs is an absolutely elite receiver, played well in their last game. And then you have a couple veterans on the outside as well as young players to complement them. Their offensive line was a big concern for me this year, and I don't think we've really gotten to see who's playing well yet. Again, an FCS opponent. But, you know, their defense was a bit of a surprise. It's a defensive unit that returned to eight starters. You mentioned Grimes. That's a concern. But to me, you're going up against an App State team that has just as many concerns. So App State overall, they're a team that's losing a lot of production. Their top four wide receivers are gone. This is a team that does try to run the ball, which I think makes them a little one-dimensional. They they lost Bear Hunter on the offensive line. He was awesome. The rest of their starters come back. But these guys, I mean, especially on the left side, have questions. Their right side's pretty good, but Anderson Hardy – and Damian Daly were both below average starters on the left side. So what are you just going to run to the right side every single time? It's a concern to me. 
Only five starters come back on their defense. That defense was 48th overall. I think you have trouble stopping North Carolina with so many new starters being broken in. And then it's just a differing level of competition. Like you have a top 50 recruit at quarterback for North Carolina. And then you have Chase Bryce for App State. Chase Bryce, who was propped up by Malik Williams, Corey Sutton, and Thomas Hennigan. Chase Bryce was horrific when we saw him. So do we think, you know, like Chase Bryce t- took a significant step forward? Or was this a guy that was leaning on some of his pass catchers? Personally, that's the way I'm leaning. 62% completion percentage, 8.6 yards per attempt. He did clean up some of the turnovers, 11 interceptions for him last year. That was previously a concern. I don't know. I, I still don't buy that Chase Bryce is there. And when you have such a drastic difference in talent overall between these rosters, I'm going to take the one point here, one and a half points with North Carolina. This might be one to wait, though. I saw ones in some spots. It's, it's surprising to me. I would take this anything inside a field goal. Yeah, I'm actually looking to short North Carolina on the season. I'm just not sure this is the spot. I want to see not only did Tony Grimes get hurt, Josh Downs got hurt in that game. Now, it didn't look serious, but it wasn't supposed nothing. supposed to be fine, it looks like. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure it was more precaution that they – you know, easy when Grimes, it looked like I'm no doctor, even though I do pretend to be. Uh, it looked like he might have had a concussion, but they, you don't want to be messing around taking those type of players off the field because th- those are difference makers. I do agree, though, that App State is not in the ideal. They're going to be fine in their conference. They're always solid, but I don't think this is a vintage team of theirs. And if knowing what we know right now, it would be UNC or pass. I am with you. Not my favorite bet on the board by any stretch. But I am, in fact, with you. Let's go to their neighbors with the Wolfpack. NC State, East Carolina. Is this a trappy game? Because I'm very high on on NC State. The spread's been bouncing around between like 10 and 11, uh, maybe a little more in some spots. But I see like 11 and a half right now. Talk to me about them versus East Carolina. Is that an upset special? Or do you think that the Wolfpack just roll through them? Yeah, I, I personally took this. When it was NC State minus 10, it's now up to minus 11 and a half. You're talking about the most veteran team in this conference, and they were solid last year. You get back Devin Leary as signal caller. He was the fourth highest graded passer in the ACC. They do lose Emeka Emezi, but they are Thomas, Devin Carter, come back. Daryl Jones transfers in from Maryland. They're, they're, they're fine at receiver. Running back, this is a position they actually recruit well. They have a four-star freshman on their team to complement Jordan Houston, who's back. He was their third leading rusher. Offensive line does lose at Kwanu, but they return all of their other starters. And this is a unit that had pretty good grades across the board. Their defense also should be very good. It's a defense that's returning 10 starters, and this defense finished 23rd last year. So at the very least, maybe their offense doesn't perform up to, perform up, perform up to expectation. This defense should be limiting opponents. And then you don't need to ask Devin Leary to go out there and win complete shootouts against a team like East Carolina. I think this just veteran presence they have should be enough to overwhelm this team. Again, these teams recruit at very different levels. East Carolina does have their starting signal caller back at Holden Ayers, but they lose three starters in their offensive line. Their defense ranked 81st last year. You only have one player returning with even honorable mention, all conference off for, off honor. So this is a, a unit that already is pretty questionable to begin with going up against a veteran offense. I think NC state rolls here, even though they are, they are, they're on the road in this game, which I guess should be noted. Yeah, Yeah, they are, but we've seen, you know, again, I'm not just going to keep pointing to Vandy, but like if you're overmatching a team, I don't, the noted East Carolina home field advantage. I'm not sure about all that. I, I think it's just two different quality of teams. Again, is it my favorite bet on the board? No, is this one that could appear on the card? I, I think so. NC State, I, I think they're a real threat to Clemson this year. If they are, you should destroy teams like this. They should win going away. The defense should stifle them. They should put up enough points to get the job done here. So that's another one. I'll, I'll lay the points there. Anything inside two touchdowns, I am happy with. Again, if you are looking to build up your bankroll, if you're saying, I want to bet all these games, but I simply can't do it. Well, one of the ways to do it is to take the money that these books are vying for your business. And to do that, to get you in the door, they're offering fantastic promos. And BetMGM is doing just that. You can get a risk-free bet of up to $1,000 with your first deposit at BetMGM. I bet there, use them all the time. Or you can use the promo code BETTINGUCFB or go to the link in the description of the video. Those are the two ways to claim it. You go in, you deposit, very simple. And you're gonna get that risk-free bet of up to $1,000. 
no reason not to do that. It's an easy way to get some potential extra money for your bankroll. You can use that to bet on egregious teams like the Arizona Wildcats. Next game, them in San Diego State. San Diego State is a team that I am looking to short after last year. Arizona, you have said this, and I kind of agree that not that they're going to be great, but they seem to be on the right trajectory. This They're taking heavy money. They were around nine. It's crossed a touchdown. They're still six-point dogs, though. Are they a live dog, and how do you break down this matchup? Yeah, I took this at, at plus nine, but I think they're definitely a live dog. This is a team I want to at least sprinkle something on the money line. Again, they're in the second year of a significant rebuild, and it wasn't going to be fixed last year. They knew that coming in, but they just recruited the 22nd overall recruiting class, 28th in transfers. They got basically a five-star. Like They got a top 50 wide receiver in Tedaroa McMillan. They get a strong transfer, a wide receiver in Jacob Cowing from UTEP. They add a couple transfers to, to add to that. Jaden Delora from Washington State. He's certainly an upgrade on what they had. I won't say he's like a phenomenal, real difference maker at quarterback, but he's what he's better than whatever they had last year. Running back is a quiet strength for this team. Michael Wiley, they still have former Northwestern player, Drake Anderson. And then on defense, no, they weren't great, but they returned eight starters. So at the very least, you're expecting incremental jumps. And you pair that with a San Diego State on the other on the other side. This is a team we know how they play. It's not going to be fast. It's going to be really run heavy, but I think they have concerns. Their defense should probably be the strength of their team. But again, that's going up against the offense. That's now the strength of this Arizona team. So I do expect some points to be put on the board. San Diego State returning seven starters on defense. But again, they have a lot to deal with. The real concern here is what they do on offense. Their offensive line lost three full-time starters. They don't really have any receivers of consequence. Like I guess Jesse Matthews is probably their number one. Braxton Burmeister comes over from Virginia Tech. He was the 10th graded quarterback out of 12 qualifying signal callers in that in that league last year. 55% completion percentage, 7.7 yards per attempt. He's mobile himself, which is good for this offense. But anytime he's forced to pass, I have real concerns here. So to sum this all up, it's an offense in Arizona, I think, which is significantly better and will score. How does San Diego State score? I'm not sure they have the guys to actually get it done and play with this Arizona team. I like Arizona plus six. I would consider them on the money line. I'm going to take them on the money line. I'll be honest. You can still find north of, just slightly north of two to one. I went to oddchopper.com. I shopped the odds. There's some plus 200s or better out there. I'm not saying they're going to win the game, obviously, but I, they win the game more than that break-even percentage because they can score. San Diego State, they had a formula and it was working, but it's a dangerous game to play like that. It's a high-variance style. They lean so hard on the defense. I don't see that working. And as much as Arizona's got their problems, I do think they're going to push this team. I've watched a lot of Virginia Tech football uh, in recent years. Not super impressed with the signal caller now for the Aztecs. I have a feeling this could be a minor upset. And I will will take the points. But if you can get inside a touchdown, to me, take the plus 200. Live a little. Uh, I I like that spot (laughs) for Arizona. They don't need no points. Arizona is going to knock them off in what I don't even think when we see the end of the year, this will not be an upset. You will see that San Diego state is not that good this year. Uh, So give me the wildcats on the money line. One of the bigger games, Cincinnati, Arkansas, two teams that last year really took steps forward for both programs. Obviously Cincinnati is breaking new ground, uh, getting into the playoffs and Arkansas finally, You know, they play such a bad schedule every year, but they really started to get it together. Tough matchup for both teams. Arkansas is a near touchdown favorite at six and a half. Cincinnati has to replace Ritter, the the corners, and multiple other positions. Can they hang with an SEC opponent like this in week one? I would be shocked. And there's a couple of reasons why. First of all, you saw Cincinnati beat up on a pretty easy schedule last year, their best win obviously against Notre Dame, but outside of that, like playing Indiana is nothing to really write home about. And their conference, it's just not anywhere near the level of an SEC team. Now you mentioned it, you're dealing with a significant rebuild for a team that's right around the top 50 in recruiting year over year. This year they were 42nd. So you're replacing quarterback. You go to either Evan Prater, who's the highest recruit in your history, or you go to, I guess, longtime backup Ben Bryant, who spent a year away from the program. You lose Alec Pierce on offense. Your offensive line 
was probably your biggest weakness last year on offense. You couldn't run the ball against some of the better defenses, especially SEC defenses. You met, you mentioned the guys they're missing on defense. Yes, they returned five starters. They're losing six. But again, the guys they're losing were premier players. Sauce Gardner, Kobe Bryant, Brian Cook, Majai Sanders on the edge. This unit is going to take a step back. And what Arkansas is going to do is they're just going to bully you and run the ball right down your throat. KJ Jefferson, dual threat. They bring back multiple players with experience at running back. Their offensive line should be fine here. They're returning four guys that have some starting experience. Again, you can try to find a threshold for how many snaps a guy plays to call him a starter. They have four guys that have played a lot on that offensive line. So it's going to be a veteran unit there. And then how do they score on this Arkansas defense? This defense is a little remade through the portal, but they have a lot of excellent players coming over from teams like LSU. I'm not too concerned about the defense here. Overall, the level of talent between these teams is significantly different. And I think you have a buying opportunity with Arkansas, who doesn't have the best record last year. Again, they were 9-4, and four, but they played in the SEC. You have Cincinnati on the other side, who went undefeated in the regular season, playing in the AAC. Arkansas is a significantly more talented team than the Cincinnati team. And now Cincinnati doesn't have the advantage of being a veteran unit where they can really lean into their positive coaching by, by Fickle, which is how they were able to get themselves to the playoffs. Willing to lay anything inside a touchdown here. Surprise, this isn't higher. And I think you have an awesome opportunity to buy an Arkansas team who's going to run the ball right down Cincinnati's throat, just like we saw Alabama do last year. Arkansas is a, a really good team. Their record doesn't always indicate it because they just play such – they even play brutal non-con. It's just awful for them. The one thing I wanted to ask you before we move to the next game – do you worry about some of the losses on the outside for Arkansas? They have an identity. They want to run it down your throat. Do you think that they have answers for a guy like, you know, Traylon or whatnot on the outside in terms of the losses, or do you think that they have to get ahead? So, you know, at first I thought this was going to be a problem for them. They kind of tried to bandage over the Traylon Burks loss multiple ways. First of all, they have a couple of players that are veterans coming back, like Warren Thompson, Katron Jackson. These are guys that have been with the program. Then they add – Oklahoma transfer, Jaden Hasselwood. They had Matt Landers. And they also have recruited pretty well. They have two four-stars coming in. Isaiah Satina, not sure I'm saying that right, and Quincy McAdoo. So they have talented players behind them. There's been a ton of hype coming out of this team in camp. Like you, you had their head coach talking about how he thinks receivers a position of strength for them. And Pittman's not a guy that's generally blowing smoke when he's talking. So I'm cautiously optimistic. Again, I don't want to just take these, these camp reports and be like, Arkansas is back. They're replacing Traylon Burks, no problem. But it sounds pretty good from everything coming out of there. There haven't been a lot of concerns, and he's actually been pretty honest. If they answer that, that's by far my biggest question. I like everything else about this team. I worry a little that if they have to play from a position of you know falling behind, it could be problematic. But I'm with you. Inside a touchdown, count me in for Arkansas. The biggest threat to Cincinnati and the team that I think is the best group of five team in the country this year would be Houston. They are a four point favorite against UTSA, another team that was really relevant last year. Some really, really good steps forward for that program. This is a tough game, but man, Houston to me returns the best quarterback in that conference, a ton of weapons all across the board. UTSA has some pieces back too. I, I'm just going to get right to it. I lean to Houston here. It's a four point spread. I think that you do as well, but talk to me about this matchup. Yeah, I think this has a chance to be a shootout where I, I favor Houston just based on level of talent. Frank Harris comes back. He's essentially returning his entire receiving group, which is awesome. Their, their old line is fairly intact. They're returning three starters there, one of whom was awesome in Makai Hart. He's their right tackle. The other two are just slightly above average on the interior. They lost a really good offensive lineman in Spencer Buford. So I think this unit could take a slight step back. But overall, it's their defense that's a major concern for me. Five starters return on this defense. It was the 73rd ranked defense in the country last year. They do add some transfers coming in. But a guy like Tony Wallace, who transfers in from TCU at corner, he wasn't listed on the depth chart. And then you dig into it, and their coach says he's ineligible for this game. So some of the guys they're trying to bandage over with aren't playing. The Tony Wallace thing is, is big, I think, for this team, especially when you're going up against a Houston team who is extremely veteran in this spot. I don't think they're the same caliber team as Cincinnati last year, but they have a lot of similar pieces returning. Their quarterback is a multi-year starter. He's back and he's mobile. 
I wouldn't look at his rushing yards from last year. He suffered a hamstring injury in week two. He's far more mobile than that. Offensive line is pretty good. It's right up there with some of the better offensive lines in this conference. You have three full-time returning starters and some other players with experience there. You have a strong receiving game coming in. And then on defense, six starters return here. Multiple players have starting experience beyond that because of injuries. And you have at least three players here with all-conference honors. I think Javarius Owens at safety is one of them. Donovan Moosin at linebacker. DeAnthony Jones on the edge is a solid player for this team. And then even Atlas Bell was their highest graded returning starter on PFF. He didn't even earn all conference honors, which is a bit of a surprise to me. So the defense, I think, should be strong here and at least capable of running with UTSA. But overall, I think this is more your shootout style game. But I have more questions with UTSA compared to Houston. So I'll take the team that recruits at a higher level, has better overall players in Houston. My personal pick to win this conference. Yeah, I – you listen – UTSA was solid last year. There's no doubt about it. But they also, I want to point out, they returned 21 starters going into last year. They were basically intact. They made serious strides. Now they suffer real actual losses. They're going to have to replace some of these guys. Not to mention, they're just going up against a team that they don't really see a caliber of a Houston that often on their schedule. I don't think people realize how good Clayton Toon really is. And I don't think people realize how good Houston was last year. They were just in the same conference as a Cincinnati team that was, for a group of five, almost historically good. So I, I think Houston takes some real steps forward. I'm not the biggest fan of their coach, but I think he will do enough to get out of the way and let them win this game and cover the spread. UTSA was 7-0 and in single-digit margin of victory games last year, yeah. which is ridiculous. So like Lafayette style. They played single-digit games against Illinois, Memphis, UNLV, Western Kentucky, Southern Miss. If you remember, Southern Miss was crap last year. UAB in Western Kentucky. Houston's better than all those teams. Even and the Brady Zappy Western Kentucky. Houston is better than every single one of those teams. Without a doubt in my mind. Yes. Four, I don't get that. Yeah. This is, I mean, we'll do our recap at the end of the show. This will be in mine. This is one of my favorite bets of the entire weekend. I think Houston should be north of a touchdown here. I really do. Um, so there we go. Now, this might be my, not, maybe not my favorite bet, but if I could pick one game to talk about because I'm a sicko, it would be the next game, and that is Texas State and Nevada. This spread, when it opened in the summer, Texas State was like 10-point underdog, and now they're almost at pick em. It's down. They're taking crazy money partly because Nevada disgraced themselves on su- pseudo-national TV. They had like eight turnovers against New Mexico State, and they still almost lost. It is not Carson Strong-led Wolfpack anymore. They got issues. Texas State is a team most people haven't heard of, but I know you have. What do they bring in? They've got a lot back. Where do we go in this spot? So I, I basically bet Texas State on the idea that this was a game that we were going to get a lot of line movement on. Fortunately, I was right here. There are reasons, I think, to look at Texas State here. Their quarterback is Lane Hatcher. He transfers in. I don't think Lane Hatcher is great by any stretch, but he's a guy that is a veteran. He's played a lot of college football before. We kind of know what he is. He's going to be their quarterback. Now, outside of that, I think you're relying a lot on your head coach, Spavital. This is a guy that has a lot of experience and This is a team I think overall could be improved in a lot of different spots. They returned four players in this offensive line that have starting experiences. Offensive line is quietly really good. You look at like their PFF grades. Dalton Cooper had an 85.3 grade. Anything above 60 is considered like above average. Anything above 80 is borderline elite. It's a weak conference. So, you know, like this guy's not going to get drafted, but that's an awesome grade. Jaden Smith above average. Russell Baker was at 70.5. Kyle Hergel was at 86.2. This is a really good offensive line. They should be able to run the ball. And with a veteran quarterback, I think that's solid enough here. Defense isn't going to be good. We know that. But fortunately, Nevada can't score. They have quarterback issues. They're breaking in a completely new run-heavy offense that wasn't recruited to play this kind of offense just yet. It's going to take a couple years. I think Texas State can score. I don't think they can stop people. But fortunately, they're playing an anemic offense. I'm going to take the point with Texas State. I was lucky enough to grab this before Nevada played a game. But even in a pick'em situation, I think Texas State is worth a flyer on. Nevada, I'm not exaggerating. They had four, five, six turnovers against New Mexico State. That's the only reason they even beat that team. And there's a real 
debate. New Mexico State might be one of the worst teams in the country. I know they were on the road, but man, that was not inspiring. And we saw that that spread crash. A ton of sharp money came in on the Aggies in that spot. I'm with you, I will say. I actually did a deep dive on Texas State yesterday. I'm not going to spin it and say the defense is going to be good. I will say they did what a lot of teams should do when you're in this position. They ravaged the portal, particularly on the D-line. They got a pair of brothers in from Louisiana Tech transfers. I'm not saying these guys are good, but they will be rotational players. I think it'll help with the depth a little bit. The big takeaway is Nevada, I think, is just non – it's a non-functional offense. They have no identity. I don't I mean, know how you back them. I, I think you you can easily pass here saying, you know what, I missed all a lot of good numbers. But it's Texas State or pass. I would not back Nevada at all in this spot. I agree with you. I mean, like if you can't score on New Mexico State, what can we, you what score on Texas State? I think that's a real question. Again, not even can you score – Every time they did anything, it was the result of turnovers. And say what you want about Lane Hatcher. He's not a liability. I'm not saying he's great, but I don't expect him to just be, you know, losing the game for them. I actually trust, of all the units, offense, defense on both sides of both teams, I trust Texas State's offense more than any other unit in this game. I agree with you. I like their offense. I like Spavadol. They're pretty fast overall when they when they're efficient. They're balanced to slightly run heavy. And I think that's the strength of their team. Again, they're, I think their offensive line is the single best unit in this game. I think they should lean into that. There is one you won't find anywhere else. That's what we do here at Betting You. We talk about <laughs> Texas State. It is interesting, though, to talk about some of these teams that played already. And another one of those is FAU. They draw Ohio in their second game. It's up to four and a half, minus 180 on the money line, 49 and a half point total. FAU looked good. I will say that Charlotte had no chance after Chris Reynolds went down and he went down. I believe it was seven, seven. I was watching that game, but Perry looked good. FAU looked good. Uh, Willie Taggart has them haven't moving the ball. Do you expect more of the same in week one? Yeah, I think they took their foot off the gas a little bit. It's kind of, well, I think one thing we can say is Charlotte's defense is not there yet. Oh this team God. is just scoring at will. And I, I took this early. I took it when it was minus three, when FAU was still playing, when it was clear they were just going to blow out Charlotte. So we get a good spread here still. I think I was surprised it didn't move more. Ohio was a complete dumpster fire. I think they're the worst team on the eastern side of the MAC. They just lost their running back, O'Shane Allison, for the year. One of the few bright spots for that team. This FAU defense appears to be fairly solid still. They, they definitely had concerns when you actually saw Chris Reynolds in the game. Yes. But... A lot of it came via explosive pl pass plays to like Grant DuBose. And even when Chris Reynolds came back in the game late, they immediately started hemorrhaging more yards. So to this point, Ohio's not a team that opens up. Curtis Rourke is not his brother. He's certainly not a dynamic passer. I think he's not even that kind of dynamic runner. Then you lose your starting running back, a team that's whole identity is predicated on the run, not to mention you do have offensive line concerns. I don't have any question that FAU is going to score at this point with what we saw against Charlotte. Is Ohio going to be able to score at all? And I personally don't think so. They don't have the explosive passing attack to exploit this FAU defense like Charlotte did when Chris Rounds was on the field. And then if they can stack the box against the run, I think this is a game over proposition. Surprise, FAU is not favored by closer to a touchdown. I was lucky to get this at minus three, four and a half, still willing to take this. I can find there's fours out there. You got to lay minus 115, but... Uh, they are out there. Go to oddshopper.com and check that out. But yeah, I'm with you. Again, some of these teams we should note, they are hitting the road in some of these situations, and that is depressing the spread a little bit. But I don't think that that's a big deal. And ultimately, the reason we do those season previews is to try to buy early on some of these teams and sell early on others. I'm with you. I don't think Ohio is a factor at all in the MAC this year. And to me, FAU would be the perennial favorite maybe in the MAC. So. I would, you know, if they were in that conference, I would favor them. So I'm with you. I don't really get this. Maybe we'll wait and see. But to me, the Charlotte game wasn't a pure indicator because of what happened. But even so, I saw enough from FAU to, to back them in the spot with you. We're in line here as well. Yeah, it's just I don't think Ohio can move the ball in offense. I brought up their O-line. They lost three starters there. They're, they're three highest graded players on offense they're returning their two worst starters both below average they can't throw with Rourke. they can't run this bad offensive line no starting running back 
defense was 99th in the country last year. Maybe they take a slight step forward, but man, I don't know. So there's a chance to be ugly. It's going to be ugly. That's what we're here for. Talked about Ohio State, Notre Dame. We talked about Georgia, Oregon. The third, maybe the third biggest game of the weekend in terms of relevance is Utah and Florida, but it's a much more competitive game. Uh, it's it's actually been swinging through zero a little bit. Utah is a three point favorite now. They opened as a slight dog. Uh, I do have a little dog money on them. I will say that, but I, I think for betting purposes, there's still a lot to digest here. Utah, you've railed against them a little bit for not doing more maybe in the portal to solidify what was a great year last year. They take on a Florida team that's got a lot of questions in my mind. Where do we begin? You could start with the Utes. Yeah, I love Utah as a team. I grabbed this when they were plus one and a half. I'm not sure I would bet it now, now that it's up to a field goal. I certainly wouldn't bet it if it gets any further. I still lean towards the Utah side. So, I mean, it's a, it's a big game. A lot of you are probably going to be watching that. If you want to just sprinkle a bet, it would be Utah for me. And there's a lot of reasons why they're a really veteran team. Cam Rising's back. Tavian Thomas is back, a running back. Two awesome tight ends in Brant Cuthie and Dalton Kincaid. Receiver is never going to be a position they recruit heavily and get like five-star talent just because they run the ball so much. But they do have some veterans like Donovan Vele, Solomon Enos. These are guys that have started for them. Offensive line, I think, is fine. Three full-time starters return here. It's a unit that's also really good at developing offensive line talent. I think this is going to be fine. Their defense is also going to be a little bit remade. This is my biggest question. You lose Devin Lloyd, and I think this defense will be fine overall. If you remember back to that bowl game when Ohio State was like throwing the ball all over the yard against them, they're playing a running back in the secondary. Like full-time running back had to play corner for this team. And he gave up a lot of production predictably, but you have a lot of returning players that are solid here. Clark Phillips is back, especially on the back end here. He's second team all Pac-12. Cole Bishop, another team, another guy that had honors in the Pac-12 last year as far as their production. I'm not sure they're going to finish much higher than 44th, considering the replacements that need to be made like Devin Lloyd, but I think they're going to be right around there. And I certainly think they're going to be a top 50 unit overall. Against Florida, we probably just need to talk this Florida Gators team because I think this is where the edges lie. They're breaking in a new coaching staff. They're asking a quarterback in Anthony Richardson, who passed 74 times last year, to go in there and take on a, a full quarterback's role. And even when he did pass, like 59% completion, 6.6 yards per attempt, six scores, five interceptions. My main concern with Florida is when they have to throw – what does that look like with Richardson? We know how good he is as a rusher. He has elite athleticism, one of the most athletic guys in the country. But when he's forced to throw, can he actually put them in games? Their receiving room is a lot of questions. Like Ricky Pearsall suffered a foot injury in the preseason. Justin Shorter is a career underachiever. Xavier Henderson and Trent Whittemore, they were both below average in terms of yards per route run. Their offensive line returns a lot of players, but you're really lacking the – like all conference level talent, none of their starters that are returning graded out above 66.7 in PFF. That's just slightly below average. They do add Osiris Torrance, who has an elite grade, but it was at Louisiana Lafayette. Now he's going into the SEC and he's playing a really strong Utah defensive line. Their defense ranked 84th in the country last year. Only seven returning starters there. One player with all conference honors last year. That was Brendan Cox. We'll see how that unit comes together, but all this to say, there's a lot of moving parts to Florida with their quarterback, their offensive line, the players they're breaking in on defense because of injury last year. Going up against a veteran Utah team, home field is going to be key here. They're playing this game at home, but to me, Utah is still the sharp side. It's hard for me to disagree because uh, I'm really not high on Florida this year. In the swamp, it, you know, it doesn't look like it's going to be like crazy hot or anything, which helps. I really do think that that's a factor. It's still a very difficult place to play. Utah's flying across the country. I think they'll be ready. Certainly, you know, I, I've said this a thousand times. Say it one more time. Utah would have been in the playoff last year if they just got it together a little <laughs> earlier. They screwed up their quarterback. They don't have that situation this year. They, they know what they're doing. I do think they are the better team. I'm certainly not taking it at three. You can find two and a half out there. I'm looking right now. I see two and a half. I'm okay with Utah minus two and a half. I, I think they're going to ultimately win a very back and forth game. Richardson's an unbelievable player, but I do think that this offense is going to be limited in some ways. I'm I'm not saying I'm not sold on their coach because I was a big Louisiana Lafayette fan, but 
but I still think this is a whole different environment. Uh, I want to see what they kind of integrate pretty quickly here. I'm going to take Utah. I think they do go in and get a hard-fought win in Gainesville. I like that. I, I have it. I'm very comfortable with the number. Again, I'm a little hesitant right now, but that's still the side I lean for sure. I would try to get this before it gets to three and a half. Yeah, again, some of these are going to be, you know, pass or like I'm not betting Florida, 0% chance. It's going to be Utah or pass uh, for me. And if you're going to find it, find it at two and a half. Next game up, South Carolina, Georgia State. Not glamorous, but you know what? The less glamorous, the bigger the edge is. Spencer Rattler uh, comes over. I really like what they're doing at South Carolina. I'm a fan of Beamer. Don't know a lot about Georgia State. I believe that was the team that should have beat Auburn last year, but that says more about Auburn than anything else. <laughs> South Carolina is a double-digit favorite, but it's inside two scores. I see them at 12 and a half right now. Are you high on this team before they get to SEC play, kind of dominating some of these non-cons? Yeah, I, I personally think so. This is a team in South Carolina that's done a ton, and they've done a lot of it through the portal. I don't think there's anything wrong with that overall. You mentioned Rattler. He was one of the best transfers in this cycle. I mean, even last year, people were down on him. He actually completed 75% of his passes for 7.9 yards per attempt, 11 touchdowns, five interceptions. It's not the greatest touchdown to interception ratio. If he can cut back on those turnovers, his passing numbers are actually pretty solid here. He was the second highest graded passer per PFF in that conference last year behind only Caleb Williams. So yeah, the switch was probably justified, but we're not talking about a player that played poorly. At times he certainly did with his turnovers, but this is a guy that still is solid production overall. And we know what he did the year before. Running back, they lose Kevin Harris and Zaquantra Wright, but luckily Marshawn Lloyd and Juju McDowell have played a bit for them. This team hammered the transfer portal at receiver two. James Madison receiver and Twain Wells, an All-American in that, that conference. He comes over. Arkansas State's Corey Rucker comes over. This is a solid player here as well. And they might have one of the best tight ends in the country in Jaheim Bell, who wasn't really highlighted by last year's quarterback group. But this guy was at 3.67 yards per route run. That is unbelievably high for a tight end. He had 497 receiving yards and just 30 catches. Plays mostly in line, but he's a guy that can flex into the slot here, 230 pounds. And they added Austin Stogner, a guy who does have familiarity with Rattler there too. Defense should be better. I think this is still the biggest concern of this team overall. But again, that's going to be a bigger concern when you're playing Tennessee, when you're playing Kentucky in those sides of the conference. Against Georgia State, I think you can certainly get by. So to me, that is the biggest difference maker here when you're just going up against, you know, like Darren Granger and Jamari Thrash rather than playing like Cedric Tillman, which is going to be massive, massive differences. I'm pretty – South Carolina is one of those teams. There's a handful this year. I think they're going to make – market improvements and it might not be shown in the overall win loss but they're going to just be a much better team and it will be shown in some of these games where they just have the talent disparity early in the year i don't think certainly you know they're not going to compete with georgia i think they're firmly behind a team like tennessee who i'm really high on uh florida's in that side too it's not going to be great for them even in the east they're better than bandy even though bandy looked pretty good uh i think early in the year though south carolina Good team, and, and as much as Rattler, maybe rightfully so in some regards, got some heat, his expectations were to win the Heisman, and he didn't do that, and now it's like, oh, like that's a great upgrade for them. What a steal in the portal. I, I think South Carolina is going to look good, and they are on the right track for sure. It might not be this year. South Carolina is a team to keep your eye on. They're going to get better as the season goes on. I agree with you. And like one last thing with Georgia's, Georgia State, there's a team that's very one-dimensional. They had a 36% pass rate last year. That was 124th in the country. South Carolina knows what they have to do to win this game. They have to play well up front. And luckily, they have some pretty good pieces on their defensive line, a team that should be growing in year one to year two. A lot of these guys like started two games, three games, one game here as rotational players, and they'll be asked to take a larger role. It's a little bit of a concern, but again, just a big talent gap overall when you look at these teams like, South Carolina's 25th in recruiting this year, ninth in transfers. You look over at Georgia State. This team was 100th in recruiting, 173rd in transfers. They are a veteran team for a G5 team, but I think you can bank on just the overall talents of South Carolina here. It's a line that's moved a lot, still comfortable with it if it's around two scores, which right now it appears you can find that number pretty easy. Yeah, you definitely can. 
Uh, so still some value there. All right, we got a couple games left, then we'll do our recap. I don't have anything to say, so the floor is yours on this one. SMU in North Texas. SMU is, has crossed 10 points. They're up to 11-point favorites. The mean green, a lot of points are going to be had in this one. The, the over-under is flirting around 70 right now. Is this a simple case that SMU just simply outscores them, or do you see another way that they get it done? I personally think so. We got a glimpse of this North Texas team last week. We we know what they're going to do. It's a very up-tempo, very run-heavy team. But I don't think people realize, like, you're going up against the strength of this SMU defense. So we already know what SMU is going to do on offense. Tanner Mordecai is going to be throwing the ball all over. The already is excellent receivers. The offensive line loses just two starters. You have three full-time replacements here, but you have other guys that have starting experience. Again, like one guy had 510 snaps, even though he technically wasn't a starter the full year. So good offensive line, good skill position players, solid quarterback play that we've seen start for this team already. Their defense returned seven starters. They finished 67th last year, and we've seen them exploited at times. But how, how were they exploited? They were 123rd in coverage and 15th in pass rush. They essentially have all-conference players everywhere on that defensive line. Elijah Chapman, Devere Levison, Turner Cox. These are awesome players up front, which is what Texas, North Texas is going to try to do. They're going to try to run on you. No confidence in Austin Ani, the like 29-year-old quarterback that he is at this point. He's been horrific as a passer throughout his career, and he didn't have to do it last week. We know they're going to try to run the ball. Good luck against that SMU front, and we know SMU is going to score. Fair enough. It's not on my card, but again, seeing North Texas, I did watch a little of them uh, in week zero. Definitely pretty clearly to get an identity of what they can do. SMU, of course. Uh, last question real quick. Anything with the coaching change there? They're in house. Yeah, I don't. I don't really think so. You're not changing schemes dramatically here. So, I don't know. You, you know there's always concerns with coaching changes, but I personally don't think it's a, a major concern. Like Rhett Lashley coached with this team from 2018 to 2019, and we saw that he he runs like that same style scheme here. So I'm not too concerned overall. Was it a concern for you? No, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything. I, I think that. When, when it's not a drastic, you know, triple option to air raid, you don't have to worry about it uh, as much. And I, I don't think that's the case here, obviously. Yeah, I'm ex not continuity, but I'm not anticipating drastic changes here. Like, I, I think Sonny Dykes and Rhett Lashley aren't too different. I would agree. Interesting game here. We got Syracuse and Louisville, a little matchup, and certainly Malik Cunningham is a dynamic playmaker. He, in some ways, is a one-man band that he has to do a, maybe too much uh, to lead Louisville to wins. Louisville was a four-point favorite. It's ticked up to five, but it's in the same ballpark. Do they have the decisive advantages over Syracuse, or do you think that Syracuse can pull the upset here? I think Louisville has the advantages here. The Syracuse team, I think, is getting better, but it's just going to take time. Like Garrett Schrader, still your quarterback. He's... You know what he is. He's not a good passer. He can get it done sometimes on the ground with his dual threat ability. It's more of like your big bruising type quarterback. They don't have great receivers there. Like they lost Taj to transfer. Their defense ranked 48th last year. They returned eight starters here. I think that's the strength of your team. But you're going up against a Louisville offense, which is still going to be strong, even though they lost some receivers to the transfer portal. You know you have Malik coming, Cunningham coming back. They added Tennessee transfer Ty and Evans at receiver in the portal. You still have some really good receivers, even though you lost Jordan Watkins and Tyler Harrell. Marshawn Ford, your tight end, he was your leading receiver last year. You get Tyler Hudson from Central Arkansas. That dude was a monster down at the FCS level. D. Wiggins comes over for Miami. And Amari Huggins-Bruce was incredibly efficient in a small sample. So I don't really think their offense takes a step back, not to mention five starters return on the offensive line. On defense, I think they're going to be much better. Seven starters here, and then this team hammered the transfer portal. This was one of the most aggressive teams in the country. It was like Louisville and Ole Miss. These two teams completely revamped their teams via the portal. This team has eight players coming in via the portal on defense and three recruits of at least four-star caliber. I'm not sure entirely who's going to start for this defense in certain spots just because they got a lot deeper, but I think we can say it's going to be better May take a little time, but I think this is a unit we can certainly look to throughout the year to be improved. And again, Syracuse, not quite a tune-up game, but certainly one where Louisville has advantages. I'm going to back the Cardinals here. 
Interesting. The car. Uh, listen, the portal is the game changer. Teams that are taking advantage of it, you're going to see them quickly mass deficiencies that they would have to maybe wait for recruits to mature. Other teams that don't do that are going to fall further behind that much quicker. So that is something to take note of. You mentioned that defense could be revamped. We know what they've got on offense. You're, you're selling me. This is a game I, I really have no interest in. I, I will take a second look. Maybe I will add it to my card because the game that I was most focused on around this time is out west. Boise State, Oregon State. Oregon State is a three-point favorite in this game. It's a good matchup. You've got a Boise State team that's always competitive against the Pac-12 team in Oregon State that is on the cusp of being relevant once again. What do you see here? Oregon State, again, I, I think we both were pretty high on them in the previews. Can they get the job done? This would be a big win to start the season for them. Yeah, I like this Oregon State team. They're kind of my sleeper in the Pac-12. Bet their win total. I That's really bad. like what they what they bring back. Yeah, this is a team, I mean, quarterback, Chance Nolan, I don't think gets the credit he deserves. This guy was the second highest graded quarterback in the conference last year. That's pretty That's pretty good. I mean, this team was 12th in overall offensive rank, 87th on defense, leaves a little bit to be desired, but we'll get to that unit in a little bit. Having Chance Nolan under center, who is actually mobile too, I think is solid. Deshaun Fenwick returns at running back. They do lose BJ Baylor, but they have some solid production there. Wide receiver, they have a lot of returning production. Trey Sean Harrison, Tajon Lindsley, like Anthony Gold. These guys have played a lot of snaps. And this is a team that's returning three starters in the offensive line. These starters were all awesome. And then they have another guy who played like pretty significant snaps. So in my mind, you could consider him a starter. Four players that have a pretty good amount of snaps, three of them full-time starters. They all had PFF grades above 77. So they're all like four elite starters for this team. Even if Chance Nolan maybe regresses, I think you can fall back on the run in a lot of matchups. And then on defense, they return nine starters here. You have five players that were at least honorable bench in all conference in the Pac-12. This defense should be better overall than the 87th rank we saw them last year. And a lot of these players come in the back end for this team. So I'm hoping you can improve pass rush just year over year. And you already had a fairly solid secondary. Boise State is a team that still has some concerns, like their quarterback, Hank Bachmeyer. But their offensive line is a major concern for me. They allowed 27 sacks last year. They lost two of their best starters. And now you, you have three starters returning. But how were you replacing these other guys? Some of the guys that they had playing rotational snaps last year or coming up during injury were downright horrific. I'm really worried about these guys coming back into full-time roles. Boise is going to be good on defense. They have nine starters returning on the 27th ranked unit overall. I'm confident in their defense. But I am not confident in their offense, especially with a run game that struggled at times because of that offensive line, a receiving game that had Bachmeyer banged up last year, not to mention a receiving game that lost Khalil Shakir, NFL draft pick Khalil Shakir, and Octavius Evans. Didn't really replace these guys. Stephen Cobbs is solid, but no other transfers coming in at receiver of consequence. The receiving game should take a step back here too. I'm going to back Oregon State, the home team here. Anything yep. around a field goal I think is completely fine. And you can easily find that line. The game's in Corvallis, as you just mentioned. Tough place to play. Good competitive game. I think they're better. I really do, and they're at home. I'm, I'm going to lay the points, too. I really do like this spot. I think that Oregon State's going to surprise some people, and I, I don't think it's crazy that Oregon State knocks off one of the big-time Pac-12 teams when we get into conference play. They're going to be a tough out for everyone they face. We'll go real quick on this last game. I, I will have a full preview out for it. Uh, because there is a couple games because it's Labor Day after the Saturday slate. You got Sunday and Monday, but you got Florida State and LSU. Uh, the game is, I believe, it's in the dome, right? It's it's the neutral venue, but it's somewhere in Louisiana. I, I know that much. LSU is a slight favorite. Two big time programs, but what do you see in this matchup? LSU is a better team talent wise. I think they have a better quarterback in Jaden Daniels, the presumed starter here. They have an awesome receiving core, elite receiving core, maybe like the best in the SEC with Boutte and Beck and, and Jenkins. And then like Brian Thomas and Malik Neighbors got experience last year. Kyron Lacey's a transfer from Louisiana Lafayette. The offensive line is completely remade. I think it will be okay. Against Florida State, I, I think that's going to be fine. There's two big mismatches in this game. One I think is this LSU receiving unit going up against the Florida State secondary 
Florida State's defense, I think, is decent here. Overall, I have concerns with their secondary. No players return with all conference honors in this back end group other than James Robinson. I think he's solid, but he's really your only key piece there. They're, you're, they're breaking in a lot of new players back there in the secondary. And then the second one is this LSU pass rush going up against Florida State's offensive line, which I didn't think was going to be a major concern, but they've already been dealing with injuries. And some of these players still aren't at full go coming in this next game. We have two good edge rushers for LSU. Ali Gay is back. He missed most of last year, but he's been solid when healthy. BJ Ojolari is a good piece. They have some pieces that come in via transfer on the defensive line on the interior. I'm concerned with this Florida State offensive line going up against this LSU front. And then even more concerned considering Florida State's identity has kind of just been to run the ball. We saw three guys over 100 yards against Duquesne last week. That's going to be far more difficult here against LSU with the talent gap, I think, that we're going to see. And with that particular mismatch. I'm on LSU. I'm surprised it's three points right now. I thought it would be four or five. I'm still willing to back this team. Jordan Travis is going to have to do a lot. Uh, this is not Duquesne. Can confirm. A little <laughs> different. And certainly, they're not in Tallahassee either. So that is one again. I'm going to dig in a little more. We'll have a full preview on it. But a really good game on that Sunday. All right. We've talked about a bunch of games. Now, before we get to our best bets, I just want to say again, for everyone that's been watching the video, shout out. If you want to support, just hit that like button. Subscribe to this channel. We are growing this community fast. And we have a ton of college football content, individual games, weekly day by games where Matt goes rapid fire through his favorite bets of a given slate. That is all on this channel. Don't miss that. Make sure you subscribe. Hit that notification bell. Why not? But talked about a bunch of games. Give me your two or three. If you only had a couple bets to make, where would you put your money? Yeah, I would go right to TCU to start. That would be my favorite one overall. I think just the level of competition between TCU and Colorado is drastic. Minus 14 right now for TCU. I grabbed it at 10 and a half. Still completely fine with that number. I think it's one where you can back just the drastic level of difference in level of competition here. Another one would be SMU against North Texas. Again, one where the strength of North Texas runs up against the strength of SMU's defense. And conversely, we know SMU is going to throw the ball all over the yard. So that's another one. And then I'll pick one more. I'm going to go with a dog, Arizona against San Diego State, plus six. I grabbed this at plus nine. But honestly, I think Arizona's live on inch here and there and throw it there. I think that's completely fine. Two units going in completely different directions. I'm certainly, of course, with you on those. I'm going to give some love to Houston. I think that people are going to find out quickly that Houston is just a simply better team than Texas San Antonio, who's a fine team. But Houston's at a different level. I really like that spread at four, uh, and you can find that. I will lay those points. And then one other one that we just talked about, I think that Oregon State is going to show a lot of people that they're much improved, and they're a team to take seriously out west. So you've got a lot of opportunities, just like in week zero. If we can't anticipate some of these teams that haven't attacked the portal, that have major concerns, we are going to rack up the wins before these lines mature and before these teams realize what they are. And that's what we're here to do at Betting You. So good week, week one in the books. It's going to be fun again. You're going to see plenty of us on this very channel, giving you updates, finding the lines and cashing the tickets. But for me, for Matt, for everyone here at Odd Chopper and Betting You, thanks again for tuning in. Thanks to BetMGM for powering the show. Go get that money. Betting UCFB, link in the description of this video. Risk-free bet up to $1,000. And on that note, let's cash the tickets. We'll be back next week, same time, same place.